Hello, hello. Okay. <laughs> cool. Okay, then um, then let me let me try to share my screen because it's it's black on my side. Um, share screen. Can you can you see the slides? Okay. Well, surprisingly, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then um, thanks for the feedback and the help. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, yeah, I guess uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, I have in 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 Hoover, I have fifty one people registered, but we have uh, twenty participants. But I'm guessing it's split. So some of you are physically there. So um, I guess I will I will be uh, German and start at the right time because there's a lot to cover. <laughs> Um, not to wait for, for, for someone else in the Zoom. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, and if, yeah, before we start, um, just uh, if, if there are any questions uh, or anything, uh, or any comments or, or anything, um, you just interrupt me, literally in the middle of the sentence and say something. Um, I will try to look into the chat as well, but I guess uh, if I don't see uh, some, some some responses, we will handle it at the at the end of the at the end of the talk. Okay. Yeah. So I guess we can we can we can start. So welcome to the training on um, physics-based uh, deep learning uh, in open form. Um, and uh, I'm writing towards physics-based deep learning in open form because we will be using C++ APIs uh, to do this. Uh, there, there, there have been some 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 efforts uh, in this as well uh, from others, but I wanted to kind of prepare um, everything that I've gathered uh, recently on this on this topic and and give some some kind of let's say give back <laughs> what I've managed to to figure out. Um, and uh, so I did it together with, with Andre uh, from Andre Weiner from 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 Tio Braunschweig. So he he kind of he's the one in, in the group here in Darmstadt. So now he's in Braunschweig. He was a former colleague from from Darmstadt who got into uh, machine learning and CFD and, and kind of dragged me into it a bit as well. Um, so what what you're seeing now um, uh, on the slide is kind of this this combination uh, of uh, a neural net neural network. Uh, that uh, is uh, the standard, so to say, uh, thing that, that we have in, in deep learning and then uh, based on this neural network and some, some uh, other, uh, let's say, um, computational frameworks, uh, you, you see these uh, standard, uh, I would say, partial differential equation, differential operators, right, that we have in CFD and then we use these, these operators then to build what, what you should probably recognize is this um, uh, passive scalar transport equation that is used to describe uh, or to teach and learn uh, CFD. And that's basically what, what physics-based uh, deep learning is uh, in a sense. So um, neural networks are used to, to approximate uh, some functions and then uh, they are differentiated. Uh, um, and then from this, these uh, differential operators, residual is built um, and this residual is evaluated at collocation points, and we're done. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> so, yeah, but we, we have to figure out how this is possible. So that's kind of the the nutshell of of the of the of the thematic, right? So what what I'm going to do is um, I would try to provide um, uh, an overview of of deep learning, uh, which is going to be boring, but I think it's it's to to maybe people that 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 know machine learning already. Oh yeah, is, is someone want to say something? Or... Yeah, no, you're fine. Okay, so uh, I will give um, uh, an overview first of, of a bo relatively like boring, maybe known topic, deep learning. But I think it's important because like when, once we cover deep learning, physics-based deep learning is explained in a couple of slides only. Yeah, so so it's not it's uh, the, the the weight ratio is leaning towards the deep learning part, and it's it's worthwhile to look into this um, uh, again, even if even if you know it. Um, and then we will look into um, uh, physics-based deep learning, um, what it, different flavors, and then focus on, on, on uh, physics-informed neural networks. Um, and then um, I will show like the minimal working example I would get, I would say, of combining the PyTorch C++ API uh, and OpenFOAM uh, to build physics-informed neural networks. 
Um, so I'm not going to give you the code and the solutions right now there at the end of the slides. I think I posted it in the chat. I can, I can do it again uh, here. So you have the slides also in Zoom. And um, so yeah, so if, if you want to skip ahead for some reason and you know this thing, then you can skip ahead and look into the code as well. Okay, so um, just uh, neural network as we know it. So um, uh, probably a basic stuff. Uh, we just have a set of, of, of uh, interlinked layers that are uh, feeding information forward. Um, and uh, we are going to look into this uh, output that's going to be a scalar. So we are just going to keep things very simple. So we have our inputs are going to be spatial coordinates and time uh, uh, for, for this talk and the output is going to be a simple scalar, a scalar function, not much to say there. And uh, when we go into these uh, hidden layers, then we see that uh, we have some uh, combinations of values from the previous layers um, that um, uh, resort to uh, matrix vector, vector multiplications plus some uh, bias that is connected to each uh, uh, node in the, in the next layer. Um, and of course, then you can use different notations to, to, to express this like the, I, I like the Einstein's notation because um, it's kind of uh, more expressive than these bold things with dot products or transpose um, uh, matrices and vectors um, because it tells you like what what is the output of the in, of the what is the output index so for those of you that don't know in Einstein's notation when you see something like w uh, ij is a matrix and then if you write lj this means that there's a contraction so there's an inner product a dot product between these two things and then you can kind of like cross j out and what is left is some kind of um, i element like a vector Vector element that you can add with bi. It's it's worthwhile look to look into this. It helps with with um, learning about uh, these these kinds of expressions. So quite standard, um, quite uh, simple stuff. Um, but and then we want to look into 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 deep learning itself. And it's actually it's not nothing nothing more um, uh, than a composition of functions. So so we we kind of start uh, so to say if you if you look into in the middle of this um, expression in equation four. So you start with the input vector. So the input vector u, yeah, in our case, this u is going to be a vector of x, y, z coordinates of a point in space and t yeah, as a point in time. So you start with this. And then, as I said, you, you, you weight these uh, values uh, by multiplying it uh, with, a, with a matrix of weights, then add the bias, and then you call the activation function to give it some similarity. And you do this uh, layer after layer after layer after layer. Um, until you end up uh, in the output layer. And in this case, uh, we are not calling any activation functions on the output layer because we want to approximate functions. And when we are approximating these functions, so the last layer is uh, what you want to get. Yeah. So if you're approximating pressure, the last layer should be pressure. It shouldn't be uh, tangents hyperbolic of pressure. So um, that's kind of why, why we are not, we are not doing um, any kind of activation in the last layer. And uh, it's nice to, to I mean, I, there's, there's some, some sense in showing these networks like graphically like this. And um, I guess it's, it's okay for understanding, but if you write it down like that, if you co focus on this kind of expressions, then everything that you do later on uh, with physics-based um, uh, deep learning, um, uh, especially when you have to design these differential operators, Things are more clear and more concrete than, than uh, drawing layers and, and arrows. So um, yeah, uh, the, the theta uh, is what we are writing down here. I mean, you could choose uh, if you want to write theta as a subscript of, of psi, uh, or if you just want to add it as another argument. So you would have something like a C um, uh, of uh, u comma theta, right? Because without theta, without the weights and the biases, uh, we don't know the output of the network. So if, if you go back, so if you want to get an output of psi here, you have to basically know the weights uh, for all these um, layers and their biases. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's no uh, sensible output. And the whole point of, of, of training of the, of the neural network is to find these, find these things. Um, okay, so just for the notation, theta are the weights and biases. So now we, we basically have a set of points uh, in a, a CFD simulation. This is going to be a set of uh, points in space time, and uh, there will be there. there uh, will be uh, sorry to sorry to interrupt. I have yeah, a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, would L zero that is the last uh, layer be X Y Z T? Uh, so um, uh, the last layer, so the last layer here is this one. That's the one that's that's deeply nested in the in the uh, 
Oh, sorry. The first layer is you. Sorry, the first layer. Yeah, yeah is the you. first layer. Yeah, the yeah first exactly. Layer. And then you you start with this. So you can you you start with X Y Z T. Yeah, that's the first layer. And then you con like combine these functions into a composition, and you end up with with um, uh, with some value. So and the, the value that you want to end up with uh, is going to be determined by uh, the data uh, that you use uh, for evaluating the error. So the network takes uh, x, y, z, t as input, and mm -hmm. as output, it will at the beginning give something totally random because these weights, uh, weights and uh, biases that you see in the equation four, they are going to be initialized randomly. Yeah. Um, so not randomly. If you have a maybe. A network that's evolving some data in time, they will be initialized by the previous time step, depending on the time frame of this and differentiation scheme or whatever, but they will not be correct. So uh, you put in u, yeah, which means x, y, z um, coordinate in space at some time t. Uh, you have the weights and biases that you have. Uh, yeah, So you say weights that I have for, for first layer uh, times the input layer plus the first layer bias gives me uh, something for the first layer. I activate the first layer with some, uh, let's say, tangent hyperbolic and go out, 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 so to say, from from this thing. Yeah, I'm going moving from from left to right, and when I end up um, uh, at the end, you see, um, I'm going to have a scalar product um, uh, in the equation four between the weight matrix and whatever I get in the layer before the last one. And I'm summing it, uh, summing with just one scalar, because if we have a network that um, is spewing out just one value here, um, then uh, we are going to just have one scalar bias. So uh, input is x, y, z, t, and output is going to be some number. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. my question. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. And then then we basically uh, set, have some sets of set of points. Okay. And then. Depending on the field that you that you choose, so if temperature, pressure, I don't know, whatever there you want to kind of approximate with with such a such a neural network, um, uh, you kind of are going to force the weights and biases to approximate this field. And how to do that? So there are different ways of of calculating the uh, error of the network or the loss uh, uh, of the network. Um, like the term error more, it's a, an approximation that we're doing, like whatever. So um, uh, one of the one of the let's say uh, losses is this uh, mean squared uh, uh, loss or mean squared error uh, that just goes uh, over all the data points that we have, um, uh, takes the value of the network, subtracts the value that we have, maybe from the CFD simulation or from some kind of uh, experimental sensor uh, at point P, um, and then squares this thing and averages it. And so, um, how how then then this this network learns? Um, uh, so we, we uh, the goal is basically to learn some theta m, yeah, which let's call this m like minimal, um, uh, that that minimizes this um, uh, error. So remember, theta are all the weights and the biases uh, in the network, and um, we would like to find uh, a globally best uh, theta, yeah, theta m. So this is going to be um, kind of the, the, the argument theta uh, that uh, we would uh, get, so to say, for a minimum error uh, M, uh, E, M, S, E. Um, and how, how to do that? Well, um, if you were searching for a minimum, you just drive the um, gradient uh, of the error with respect to um, theta to zero. Yeah. So this is just written down again in this uh, notation like component wise notation so i want to take the partial derivative of my uh, mean squared error or loss with respect to uh, theta i which is going to be any so this is really important so any weight from so this means from any uh, layer or, or any node yeah uh, needs to go to to zero or any bias from any um, layer or any node needs to go to zero so all of them yeah and um, so because this approximation is going to be uh, inexact, so you're not unlikely going to take uh, nonlinear like activation functions and then hit a function exactly up to machine tolerance, um, uh, we want to drive, so to say, these, uh, these uh, uh, components um, to zero. And when you, when you take the partial derivative of this, of this error or following the chain rule, you get the, this difference uh, of the values between uh, the neural network value at the point uh, in space-time minus uh, the actual value, let's call it from experiment maybe, yeah? uh, or from a simulation times the partial derivative uh, of the network with respect to the um, weight or the bias. Um, um, so yeah, and then, then this this kind of this 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 uh, uh, let's say component of the, of the gradient of the network with respect to the uh, uh, parameters 
uh, they should go to zero. And the question is now, yeah, so why M? So why, why are we now writing this, this M on theta on our weights and biases? As I mentioned before, so in the beginning, we get some, some initialization that's not good. And the idea is to iteratively improve these uh, weights and biases until we actually satisfy this, this uh, equation seven. So yeah, for as I said, those of you that know all this, bear with me because it's, it's, you need to know this. Um, um, it's a basis for, the, for, the, for everything that's, that's physics-based later on. Um, okay, and uh, so what, 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 do we, uh, what do we do? Let's say that we somehow or like imagine that we somehow know these partial derivatives of the network with respect to weights and biases. So if, uh, again, like Einstein's notation is I means um, um, kind of like a vector, yeah? Ij is a matrix. So it depends on what, what your C is. So since we are now dealing with a scalar output a neural network, we are going to, if you take a gradient of it, you will get a vector. Yeah? Uh, so uh, in vector notation, it's just uh, the gradient of the network with respect to the uh, biases and this, this delta, uh, sorry, uh, NABLA notation. Okay, so once let's imagine that we have this. Magically, somebody gave this to us, and then, then we are at a point UP, and we want to um, uh, uh, see how we must change uh, the uh, network weight, uh, weights and uh, biases uh, uh, in order to uh, get a better approximation. And, and uh, the way to do that uh, is to move uh, in the direction um, of the steepest descent, so to say, right, of the, let's say, gradient descent. Uh, so we want to go down, um, uh, not up, because the gradient is showing in the direction of up, yeah, in the increasing value. So we want to go down along the uh, the gradient, and uh, you don't go, of course, uh, you don't you don't usually take the full gradient value. You scale it by some lambda uh, in each iteration, so to say. And this, how you scale this with this lambda um, uh, in the gradient descent, there are many many uh, flavors of these algorithms. It's quite involved uh, how to do that in a stable way. This is just a didactical explanation that we need for, for, for physics-based stuff later. So um, then the question is, of course, okay, you use this, uh, you have the magic uh, uh, gradient that popped out of the sky and um, you can uh, uh, calculate in the next iteration. So theta m plus one, you can calculate from theta m and some uh, gradient descent uh, step, which is what, what you see like if you're doing optimizer step, if you, if you already have some experience with classical deep learning, this is what you do. Um, and um, the question is then, well, but, but I have 100,000 points. Yeah, so I have this change of theta for one point, like right, for UP, and then if I have 100,000 data points, um, I may go and uh, calculate this for every data point and average, right? So maybe not a good idea if the, if the uh, um, test set or, uh, or the, the training set, sorry, is, the, is large. Uh, I can uh, use batches, yeah, select some, some subsets uh, of the to total data and then average this, this uh, uh, change uh, of, the, of the weights and biases. Or I can randomly select uh, subsets from, from data, data points and then this would be like a stochastic gradient descent. So these are different serious algorithms are more complex than what I'm showing, but that's not the point of this talk. Um, okay, and this is what I just basically uh, said. So. Um, Think for a second. So let's say that we have a network like that looks like this. Um, and we want to look into gradient evaluation. So I probably made a mistake because I, I'm very bad at, at arithmetic. So so if I if if I write down this network, so we have the L2 layer is uh, like the final one. So we are going to have F, uh, uh, so we are going to have the weights uh, at, uh, um, uh, layer two multiplied by the activation from the layer one and the layer one is going to be weights for the layer, the layer, layer one multiplied by the input plus the bias at, at input. So just this simple network. And then, okay, so now for the uh, calculation of the uh, change of, of the weights and biases among all of the weights that we have in these uh, W and, and B um, uh, vectors, among all of them, uh, I would just like to know one. Yeah, so what, what would be the partial derivative of the network um, um, uh, at layer one, yeah, connecting uh, first node um, uh, with the third node. Yeah, so the first node um, uh, in the layer one with the third node in layer two. So, um, and I, as I say, I can immediately apologize. That's probably wrong. Um, so you just apply chain rule, right? You take the partial derivative, apply the chain rule, and then you get this, this expression. The, the point here is not that... I may or may have not done a mistake here. The point is that um, this doesn't make sense to do uh, in practice because if you had to write down this expression uh, for, for a deep neural network, you would be writing 
for a long time. And uh, uh, to make things worse, uh, you don't just have a network, so to say, that works properly. Yeah. So the, in terms of the number of layers and the depth of the layers, this is some, somehow already becoming common public knowledge. Right? So you need to somehow find a network architecture that works. And then you cannot, of course, write this down somehow uh, for a changing network uh, that changes during hyperparameter tuning. Yeah? So if you try changing architecture, you have to calculate these things again. So um, yeah, let's use finite differences, right? So um, they generalize perfectly to arbitrary architectures. Yeah, you can just take the value of the network um, at some, um, uh, let's say, uh, current uh, vector of weights and biases minus, uh, you go backward because you don't have the new one. So minus the value of the network, so to say, at the, um, at the previous uh, uh, weight uh, vector divided by, by the difference and you have the gradient. The problem is that this is uh, not computational, computationally tractable, um, uh, because if you if you consider it for for a deep matrix, a deep uh, learning uh, network, uh, you're going to have these matrices, weight matrices that are going to be huge, and there's going to be a bias every time that's as long as the layer, and if you want to sum them all up, you can sum them up and see, okay, um, it's not something. I mean, if you need to evaluate this partial derivative for every combination um, of these uh, uh, nodes then uh, this really uh, explodes. That's one problem. And another problem is, um, is what people are always uh, mentioning uh, in, in these talks and, and, and in books, uh, uh, truncation errors. So the, indirectly, yes, indirectly, the problem uh, of finite differences to, uh, in, in terms of, of, of training them, um, indirectly, these, these truncation errors or round of rounding errors uh, are the problem, but only indirectly. Yeah? So, um, the actual problem uh, are the cancellation errors, yeah? so floating point cancellation errors. And that's something that everyone that's doing anything with numerics should at least hear. That's why I put it here. So because that's something I had to also kind of learn for myself as I was going into this and other problems in numerics. And so as, as we start to convert, let's say that we, we are doing this training and we are uh, increasing, uh, let's say, accuracy of theta. So we are um, uh, learning better and better these network parameters and we are going towards m yeah towards large m towards the optimal value so as you go there um the the differences between the network outputs is going to they are going to go to zero yeah and the differences between the uh, the weights um uh, and biases they are going to also go to zero yeah not to zero in the mathematical asymptotic sense they are going to go to zero in the sense of floating point numbers because on on the computer we have limited precision so um, with limited precision, as these weights get close to each other, if you look at this theta i m and theta i m minus um, one, uh, I just like wrote purposely uh, the numbers so that um, everything cancels, so to say, up to the last three digits. Yeah. If somebody sees an arithmetic error, just write in the chat. But and then I imagined, I just imagined by some chance uh, the rest of the real number, the rest of the real number, the actual number is just like having threes here. And the rest of this real number has twos, yeah? Just imagine. Um, uh, and the actual difference between these two real numbers uh, would be uh, a bunch of zeros, then four, five, uh, four, six, seven, and then a bunch of ones. The problem is, um, uh, as the, these numbers come closer to each other, you have something called partial cancellation, not truncation, but partial cancellation, because you have, you're using precision uh, in the mantissa, yeah, uh, but you, you cannot really use it because the number values are the same. So you have the precision in terms of storing the output, but the difference between those numbers goes to, to zero too fast. Uh, so all these zeros that you see before, four, five, four, six, seven, are no, of no use for us. Actually, we would like to um, reset the exponent in the floating point uh, format set it to such a way that you have a normalized uh, a number that would have 4.6711111111 going after it. But that's, that's not possible because there's no way to store these intermediate results. Depending on, on um, this uh, floating point um, uh, system, you may store one or two digits more to save some precision, but you cannot st store a real number on the computer, right? Um, because of the, of the fixed space. So the problem is, as those weights and biases come close to each other, um, uh, the, their difference goes to zero too fast. And if their this difference goes to zero too fast, then the gradient goes to zero too fast and the network uh, uh, stalls. Because if you remember before, you need the gradient, you need the gradient um, to, to uh, uh, calculate the next increment of, of, these, of these parameters. And if the gradient goes artificially to zero, then you're not moving. 
you're not changing anything. So that's the, the reason for this. Um, yeah, and if you look at this, and this is, I think, important also for, for CFD um, um, uh, to hear this once, probably most of you know this, but I just wanted to share it anyway. So um, the problem is, again, um, that we also have inexactness in our calculation with finite differences, because uh, these expressions, uh, they, they, are, they have some order of accuracy of H of P, uh, depending on uh, how many points you take uh, to calculate the differences, you will have first, second, five, fifth, whatever order. Um, and uh, the problem is um, that uh, for, for, these, for these terms, um, uh, it's important to know this because um, there's an additional uh, inaccuracy in calculating the gradient in the network coming just from by the approximation of the slope, yeah, by finite differences. And of course, um, yeah, these points are some details if, if you want to know exactly when the full cancellation happens. And this is an interesting thing. So if you evaluate with finite differences, um, just uh, the, the derivative of cosine, uh, so using central differencing and using um, a forward differencing, and you take the take the error with respect to the actual you know exact function. Yeah, if you know the derivative of cosine, uh, then you see uh, uh, something that's that's interesting. So um, the blue one is the first order uh, difference formula. The orange one is the second order difference formula. So the second order you get better absolute accuracy, and you have a better slope. Yeah, so as the H uh, is reduced, so as the discretization length goes down, the, your error drops down quicker. But the problem is that this cancellation then happens quicker. So you see, we start by some, somewhere around 10 to the minus one, and we want to resolve, we want to resolve our scales in our simulation, yeah, in CFD simulation. You cannot go indefinitely. Yeah? That's the problem with scale bridging in, in, in general, so to say. So at some point, you're going to hit uh, total cancellation, and then the error of the expression is going to go, go up and then it makes no sense. Uh, you're not winning anything with central differencing compared to, to, to first order. Um, okay, just uh, the digression. So another thing, so let's say, okay, obviously finite differences are completely out of the question. So let's use some symbol symbolic calculations. So there are software like SymPy Mathematica and they, they can get closed form expressions uh, from, from such a neural network, you know, having in mind that the neural network is nothing more than a composition of functions. So you can write it down literally um, as we did in the previous slide, and then use SymPy or something, and then calculate the uh, calculate the gradient that you need to for training. It doesn't work if you ever try to do some some root finding for some higher order polynomials or something. You get already there. You get closed form expressions that are huge uh, in terms of memory and also of CPU to to evaluate this. So. Coming to the point, uh, this is the backbone also of um, not just deep learning, but to, to physics-based uh, deep learning. Uh, we, we use, instead of like using symbolic calculations and instead of using finite differences and writing things ourselves, uh, we can use something called reverse mode automatic differentiation. And um, that's uh, uh, AD, uh, short, um, uh, and this is like the basis for, for evaluating derivatives uh, in neural networks. And that's the basis for the backpropagation algorithm. So if you look at uh, some function, you, you have a function f taking arguments x, y, and z, doing some arithmetics with them, right? Uh, you, uh, you, if you parameterize them in a, in a clever way, um, uh, you can have some uh, intermediate uh, variables. So um, how does this parameterization work? So you, you uh, formulate uh, mathematic expressions uh, using a direct acyclic graph. So you have x, y, and z. So you say first, so let's, I choose, so first I can do like x plus y, and I store x plus y in the intermediate variable u, okay? But uh, this already tells me some information. So um, you know, if I take a partial derivative of u with respect to x along this uh, edge of the graph, it's going to be one, if y is going to be um, also one. Then I say, okay, well, now I have u, I multiply u with z and get um, uh, v, yeah, as a, as a intermediate variable. And this already gives me some partial derivatives. So if I look at this v as an intermediate variable, I take a partial derivative with respect to u, it's set, whatever set is. And um, this is going to be, um, uh, my partial derivative with respect to set is going to be uh, one. Yeah, because we just have set. So and this is nice because you see that these partial derivatives like this set value or z value. Yeah, I've <laughs> been in German for a long time. So z value. Um, um, you can, you already know it, yeah? You know it um, um, immediately. You don't have to, uh, you know, evaluate it. You know the expression. You can code this in, in, in your code, you can code it immediately. And because this is possible, 
um, then you can later on apply chain rule coming from the uh, farther pa uh, right path of the of the of this uh, acyclic graph uh, going all the way um, um, up yeah with depending on uh, which partial derivative you want to have so if you take the partial derivative of this function with respect to x uh, you look at the variables that are dependent uh, on x this information you have to of course store <laughs> as you calculate this to know uh, which path to take along this graph and then you just say, okay, uh, partial v over um, of f um, uh, is going to be one, and then partial u, you just go and collect, it's going to be z, um, um, uh, and you go on and on, and then you just, okay, see, okay, it's z. Yeah? So, so you can really, really, um, um, uh, uh, in an effective uh, way, effective in terms of scaling of your computational costs compared to uh, symbolic evaluation and finite differences, you can evaluate partial derivatives um, of, of this function. And, Again, yeah, the neural network is nothing more than a composition of functions. So great, this works for a neural network. The neural network is also um, an acyclic graph, so it also fits. And um, this is the stuff that's uh, basically um, uh, exact. Yeah, if you look at this this uh, uh, image on the left, you see that we actually have exact um, um, uh, values, exact in terms of uh, that we don't have a uh, finite difference induced floating point cancellation error. So you may have, I mean, depending on what your input is and what your function actually does, yeah, of course, you may have cancellation errors in general. Yeah, If you have x minus y times z and x and y come close to each other, um, you take two, two samples for your training that are next to each other in terms of uh, units in the last place, of course, you'll have cancellation. But there's no finite difference in induced uh, floating point cancellation errors. And there are no discretization errors because these expressions that you get are exact in, in mathematical sense. Um, it works automatically for arbitrary NN architectures. Um, and it's, yeah, this is what I said, computational more efficient. And it's like actually responsible for reviving the deep learning. So it's reverse mode automatic differentiation. Okay, so um, just uh, to, to summarize this, this deep learning part um, uh, as a, as a, as a uh, so to say, uh, the, the core part of, of, of what I wanted to say. I'm, I'm kind of looking at this as a computational fluid dynamics uh, person. Um, and um, I, this is just something that, that's um, my experience so far. So it's not a silver bullet. Uh, there's some math that, that proves that these neural networks are universal function approximators, but you don't know how to find it, um, um, find the function, so to say. Um, so Finding this, this minimal set of weights and biases depends on the step that you take, the, the solver step lambda, the architecture of the network, the activation function, those are your hyperparameters. And those are free, yeah? So they're never free. If you hear free parameter, you know always it costs a lot. So it costs either your time or your graduate or PhD student's time. This is funny. So you see this in talks like student descent algorithm is called. <laughs> you basically give this to a person and the poor person then has to find the architecture that works. Or you can somehow try to do automatic things like, or semi-automatic um, uh, grid searches, Monte Carlo, Bayesian optimizations, or something like this. Um, uh, another thing is, uh, once these hyperparameters are tuned, um, uh, we have found some minimal um, um, uh, uh, loss. But uh, in response to some, uh, in the best case scenario, if you use like grid search, Monte Carlo, Bayesian optimization, you, you get it. Um, over some response surface, or you model your parameter, hyperparameter space by some kind of response function and you find the minimum with respect to this response function. If this response function actually models the hyperparameter space and resolves all the minima, you have no idea. So there's no way of knowing this. And um, training takes a lot of computational time and resources. And that's a topic also for physics-based um, uh, learning where you hear, okay, this is going to, yeah, this is, I can produce CFD results in, in real time. Yes, after spending six months of finding hyperparameters and, and tuning the, the network. So uh, another point is for me, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on trying to do a lot of work in, in uh, two-phase flows where you have very stiff uh, systems of, of um, some couple like basically Navier-Stokes equations for multi-phase flows and on curvature and surface tension. And well, what's another interesting point for, for CFD um, um, researchers. So if you use any kind of stochasticity in your, in your approach, every time you run the, the, the training, like for the next time step, you will get slightly different output. So if you take a stationary droplet, you want to train the curvature with this, uh, and it's supposed to stay in place um, uh, every time that you train on the same 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 data set, you get some some slightly different curvature, which is um, in some cases bad. 
Okay, so to summarize, uh, so um, uh, uh, what we are working with are compositional functions. Um, uh, we have something that's uh, a, fu a generalized function approximator approximate that's trained by minimizing uh, some, some loss. Um, uh, we, are, we, we do this by driving some gradients to zero um, uh, we do, uh, and, and how to, how, how, how to like basically change the, the, the parameters is taking these, these gradients and uh, doing a steepest descent or gradient descent. Um, and we can do this very nicely using reverse mode automatic differentiation because of all the properties it has. Okay, so there's some literature survey. I'm not going to go over this. Uh, you have the slides. You can you can uh, look at this. So um, it's for physics-based learning. You have different flavors of this. Uh, the idea started in 1998. It stopped because um, uh, it was difficult to evaluate network gradients, and it was uh, revived in some really interesting uh, way by uh, Racy et al. Professor Kardianakis, I think. Um, his name. So, um, and this is what we are going to focus on today. Uh, so, physics-informed neural networks of, of all these different interesting approaches. Okay. So, how does a physics-based um, uh, physics-informed uh, neural network work? Um, uh, coming back to the uh, introductory slide. So uh, now we have all the building blocks, right? So. Um, uh, we know uh, how deep learning works uh, with this network, and we can now take the reverse uh, mode automatic differentiation or forward mode, I don't know, um, uh, but reverse mode is already used for network training, so you can um, uh, reuse it again to build the operators. Um, um, uh, and once, once you differentiate the network using this AD stuff um, uh, in the way that you want, you uh, kind of plug um, uh, uh, all these uh, operators into an equation and what to do with the equation. So if we evaluate this equation uh, right now, we will get something that's uh, not good. Yeah, we will get large error. And what we want to do, uh, we call this error a residual of the PDE. And we basically then drive the residual to zero. So we extend the loss function of the network with these PDE residuals. And this way, the net neural network learns both the data and the partial differential equation. Okay, that's that simple. It really, it's, it really, the concept is really elegant and simple. Um, so um, there are some, 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 of course, technical things that you have to know. Um, and um, so once we go over this graph, uh, you need to be aware of the fact that you have to cache um, uh, these partial derivatives to recompute um, uh, uh, these these gradients of the network, um, and they have to be cached again. Yeah, for if you want to have higher order differential operators. Like if you go above a gradient, yeah, you have to then, uh, of course, um, uh, cache, these, uh, cache this information again. And why is this important? I mean, uh, caching is used to store, uh, save um, um, uh, computational time. Um, and this is some kind of like, a, a, let's say, an efficiency, a computational efficiency tool that you, that you find in these frameworks. And if you don't know this, then you'll be surprised when you start programming, programming these, uh, these things. Okay, so... Um, the interesting thing about the numerical method itself, uh, if you do it like, like this, is that you don't have any discretization errors per se. I mean, discretization in the, in the terms of, you know, um, what, what we are used to with finite volumes in open form. You don't, you don't have it uh, because the, the, the automatic differentiation gives you like analytical derivatives. Um, uh, the problem is um, that, um, yeah, I mean, not the problem, but the difference between what we were doing before. So before we were evaluating these, these um, derivatives uh, to train the network. And now we have to um, take partial derivatives of the forward pass of the network uh, with respect to, to uh, NN inputs. So the, the inputs of the network, not with respect to the training of uh, uh, um, uh, hyperparameters, right? So, uh, no, sorry, not hyperparameters, not, not with respect to the training weights and biases. Um, and yeah, so how, how, does, how do we construct these, uh, these uh, derivatives? So um, I'm, I'm working with um, uh, PyTorch, uh, with the C++ API, um, and I guess uh, it's similar in other, in other software, but I can't say this 100%. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, these, these um, uh, let's say, operators are built using Jacobians. And um, you have to be aware, so this, this boring stuff regarding how the network maps some um, uh, RK, RK space to RL space uh, and what are the dimensions and blah, blah. I mean, this boring stuff is something that you have to unfortunately know uh, because this determines the form um, uh, of the, um, let's say, or the dimensions of the matrices that you're going to use to build the differential operators. So you have to be really careful and aware of, of 
what your matrix uh, look, what your uh, um, network looks like, and what it does. Um, so um, also in terms of the loss uh, uh, of the network or in terms of the output of the networks, uh, this is super important to know the dimensions and to be aware of the dimensions. You have to literally, literally like write them down on, on your iPad or whatever um, and, and be aware of, 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 of this. Uh, so um, if you look at the gradient descent, uh, uh, the stuff that I was showing with this small simple graph uh, and uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation is a didactically nice example, but that's not what the framework framework, uh, uh, I mean, under the hood, yes, but the framework does it in a bit more uh, abstract way. It builds uh, 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 these partial derivatives um, called basically Jacobian. So you take the function uh, that can be a vector output function or a scalar output function. The, the, the network um, loss is a scalar output function. And you take the partial derivative of the network with respect to the training parameter. And then uh, you take the partial derivative of the loss with respect to the uh, training uh, network output. And by chain rule, you get the partial derivative of the uh, loss with respect to the um, training parameter. So um, it's just like applying chain rule, but to apply this chain rule, uh, these Jacobians are built under the hood and uh, scalar products are used. And that's super important because when we, when we go now into actual, let's say, uh, example, so we, we, we look into uh, the network that's uh, generating the scalar output, uh, I'm going to drop this NN superscript and just from now on, Psi is not an exact value. So when you see Psi uh, from UP, it's a network uh, approximation. So you take the Jacobian of the scalar function um, uh, with respect to the UP input vector and it's going to be partial X, Y, uh, Z uh, and T yeah, of, of the network. And you multiply it by one. And why, I mean, why do you multiply by one? Because if the framework is, is built like this, um, uh, you have to give it some kind of um, uh, value, so to say that is going to multiply the Jacobian with, with to generate uh, what you have. And in this case, since we have a scalar output uh, neural network, we get everything that we need in the Jacobian. So the Jacobian is already, it already has components that we need. So if you want to calculate the gradient of the network, uh, not with respect to uh, its training parameters, but with respect to the input, yeah? So you just a normal classical CFD spatial gradient, uh, that's going to be the first three components of, of the Jacobian to, of Jacobian of the network. You see, so you can just assemble, you know, partial X, Y, Z, plug it into a vector, that's your gradient. And then you take the partial derivative and um, over time, which is the final, you know, the final, the fourth uh, uh, element in the vector, and you already have two operators. So we can already build some kind of partial differential equation from these two operators. And if you want to go uh, and build this uh, passive scalar transport um, equation, then you just go a step further and you calculate the Hessian, so the Jacobian of a Jacobian. This will generate some things that are weird, like the partial derivative um, uh, of um, the network over Y multiplied by the partial derivative over T. I don't know, maybe somebody needs this from physics or somewhere else. I haven't seen this myself so far in CFD, but what you basically get is like this large network that has a bunch of stuff inside that you may or may not need. And then the question is how to gather the stuff that you do need. And if you, if you need for your uh, physics-based um, uh, model, uh, if you need the, um, the, the Laplacian operator, which is the divergence of uh, the gradient, um, then you just have to um, sum up, the, the, you have to take the trace of the matrix to sum up the, the diagonal um, uh, elements and you do it by multiplying the Hessian uh, with um, the uh, unit uh, matrix. And then you again multiply by some uh, vector that has one, one, uh, one, zero. Why? Because I'm not, for, for, you know, for a Laplacian, Laplacian doesn't have the second temporal derivative that I would otherwise pick up. Yeah, so I zero it here um, like this. And this is kind of mathematically then the expression uh, that, that I get. And you have to really then literally like program this. At least in, in, in uh, Torch uh, C++ API, you have to um, use Autograd and specify these matrices. And, and yeah, then the question is basically, okay, what if I switch, if I say, UP is going to be an input vector that has time first and then the spatial coordinate. Does this work? Nope, uh, because then if I change these input parameters, um, the Hessian changes and the Jacobian changes. So then I'm going to have partial T here in the first row. Yeah, and then if I have partial T in the first row and I pick up here in the first row, the first element, I would have partial T, partial Y, partial Z. This is not a gradient, obviously. So you really have to be really aware of this and, and be careful in constructing these, um, these operators because the, the, the method itself will not tell you. It will just 
try to approximate whatever you kind of assemble in terms of differential operators and chuck into the uh, residual, it will try to approximate in the least squares sense. So it will some you can write some crazy PDEs and it will it will do it. Okay, another point are uh, activation functions. Uh, so um, uh, since we are like differentiating with respect to the uh, input, um, uh, may, sometimes many times these activation functions should be differentiable and differentiable activation functions, they increase the number of training iterations. So, you know, if you use Tangent's hyperbolic or um, uh, sigmoid, I think is the name, uh, then uh, you basically, you, you have trouble with training. So you are basically then one, one assembles the, uh, the total loss as the loss of the data. Yes, yeah, so we have the data loss. Uh, this is just the difference of values of the network minus the um, uh, actual value. Then the, some, some um, boundary Dirichlet um, uh, or fixed value boundary condition. This is BD, then the Neumann boundary condition. You just take the gradient to the network square it, right? It should be zero, right? If it's Neumann, uh, if it's fixed gradient, you're going to have minus some vector. Uh, and then you have um, um, uh, the, the um, internal um, initial, sorry, initial um, uh, error that takes, says take, take the network at some sample point in space at time t0 minus the actual value at this point minus uh, uh, at the time t0 square it and that's your error. So um, yeah, and uh, an important thing is this, this when you train the, 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 the physics based um, or pin um, a, a, a network like this, it's going to satisfy all these things. You pray that it does it. Um, and it's going to do it in the least square sense. So you're not satisfying uh, initial and boundary conditions exactly, which is uh, an important, important thing. So when do, when, do we, um, when do we need this? So if you have inverse problems, so you want to recover the solution of a PDE and you just don't know a boundary condition. Somebody gives you a part from industry and they don't, cannot measure temperature there because it's adjacent to something else. You want to solve some heat equation without knowing a boundary condition. That's what it's good for. You don't need know the heat transfer coefficient. You have some measurements uh, of, of, of flow and, and, and temperature. Then for high dimensional PDEs, so if you have partial derivatives that have 11, um, like partial, like 11th derivative, you know, 11th order derivative or something, I don't know. Um, finite differences don't work for this. Um, and if you want to do optimization, so once you manage to train this thing, then of course the forward pass of the network is faster than CFD. Yeah, but this is important. Once it's trained, and found, yeah. So um, then it's really fast to evaluate, and, and it could be, and it should be like way more accurate than uh, some some reduced order modeling or some one D ODE solution for some for some problems. So, so surrogate models are are the let's say one possible applications. Okay. Also, um, I'm already mentioning. So it's not a silver bullet. So you cannot just plug this in, train things, and then you are the solving all world's problems. Um, uh, if you're just summing up these, 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 these errors, they are going to have different values and often very different gradients, okay? So uh, if you just then regularize uh, this with some, some scalar coefficients, then yeah, yeah, we have more, more, free, uh, more free parameters, yeah, free in terms of finding them. Uh, so which is the first step that you can take, but there are some clever alternatives I'm listing here. You can read them from the slides, investigate them yourself if you start doing this. Um, and uh, the different error contribution, right, uh, can, can also mean even if you, if you solve this problem, uh, you may still end up that the pin uh, somehow, like, you know, it, it will fit a boundary condition on one part of your domain better, so to say, than satisfying the PDE residuals in the bulk or something. So, you know, it, it chooses, so to say, what, what error to, to um, let's say, minimize better um, in a way that's really difficult to understand. There's not yet much mathematics about it. So, um, okay, an another thing is we inherit the curse of hyperparameter dimensionality. So all the problems with hyperparameter tuning we inherit here. Um, it, it takes many iterations to train, yeah, because we have these differential activation functions. We have dim diminishing gradients uh, by the nature of those, those, those functions, so to say. So uh, you re really need small, small step sizes when, when you go into, into uh, gradient descent. Um, then um, we are now evaluating, imagine Navier-Stokes equations, or let's say coupled Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, then there are going to be many of these differential operators that are evaluated using the automatic differentiation framework. And this costs, so it, this is not free for large networks. Um, okay, and um, it, so of course, once this all is working and you're happy, um, um, it still has, uh, you get like PDE solutions very quickly in a very good way. Um, but it, you have to be aware of this, and then it takes a lot of still unautomated effort to, to, to get there. 
Okay, so to summarize, um, uh, these things are really uh, like simple compared to you know programming solving these PDEs in open form. Imagine programming open form from scratch or, or Phoenix that was mentioned in the previous uh, training or something like that. So, so of course this is just just chuck it at the end of the uh, uh, network, some some stuff up, and it, you get something out. So it's it's really it's a simple simple concept. Um, uh, but um, of course, you have to understand what the network approximates. You have to understand how these Jacobians are built and how to construct the differential operators. Um, then um, you have to write down, of course, the, 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 the total loss uh, in a clever way uh, and apply either adaptive activation functions or something more clever to improve, improve the training, which is what I didn't, didn't do in the um, example. I hope we have, yeah, we have just about enough time for the example. Um, okay, so if you if you just want to solve a normal partial differential equation, it's going to be normal in terms of you know some not some some crazy PDEs um, with you know in 50 dimensions, right? So or, or some parameterized PDEs or stochastic PDEs or or something. Yeah, so just CFD stuff. It's faster and more accurate to use classical numerical methods still, uh, but there's there's potential in combining this uh, physics-based uh, stuff with classical numerical methods, of course. Okay, so there's some other videos that I link you can you can look into. Let's go into the example. We don't have much much time left. So super simple example. Uh, I want to learn a sphere. Yeah, so so I have a sphere that can be represented as a level set. So this this is a circle that you see is just a schematic in two two D. We're going to do it in three D. So it's a set of all values where my uh, um, uh, function scalar function has an output of zero. And I choose a, a sine distance field to a sphere, which is basically take the difference between, I don't have to explain this, you know this all, that's super simple stuff. And what, what, what we do is then um, uh, we take some sampling points, you see the pair XP of CP, uh, just randomly sample it from the domain omega, you see the boundaries, this box. Uh, and I want to ensure that the, 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 the magnitude of the gradient of the field that I'm approximating is one. This is, this is, you find this in the level set method when you want to add vector the sign distance uh, field. Um, so yeah, uh, case setup, unit box domain, um, uh, sphere radius 0 0.5, uh, 25, sorry, centered at uh, the middle. Um, and what's the motivation? Why? I'm talking about this thing before. So coupling of, of, of physics uh, informed neural networks or physics-based machine learning with CFD is sometimes interesting. So if you want to solve this equation, so this is a nonlinear equation, um, uh, discretizing this, there are some, maybe some tricks to reformulate the equation, but discretizing this in open form or in general in unstructured finite volume methods where you have small stencils is quite complex. Um, not to go now into this, but um, uh, if you're happy with an approximate solution, uh, you might use like a pin or something like that. So this is, a, let's say, thought up, uh, out uh, or made up scientific uh, motivation for this. So um, uh, there's some, some technical points that are listed here. So when you, when you start working with the PyTorch C++ API in open form, there's some include order that you have to, you have to include libtorch stuff before open form, otherwise uh, you get scary errors. Uh, you have to compile open form with the C++ 14 or higher. So this is what I wrote down how to do here. Um, so that's just some technical stuff. And then let's go into, into some, some code snippets. There's a link in the slides. I put the link on, um, uh, to the slides in, in both chats, so you can just go to the source code if you want. So what I did, I just took the simplest possible approach. There's something called a se sequential um, a model um, uh, inside PyTorch that makes uh, it very easy to, to build these, um, these uh, multi-layer perceptrons. Um, uh, so you just kind of have a for loop, you add the first layer, then in for loop, you add the hidden layers and the activation function. And then you can add the output layer, and this is programmed in uh, an open form application that takes um, that either reads the number of hidden layers and the, their depth from the dictionary, or just on the command line. So that's if you work with open form a bit, and it's not a, not a super complex thing. Now, um, a, a super important detail is to communicate. So how to how do we communicate geometric fields that we work with in open form? Uh, to to LibTorch, yeah. I'm going to call LibTorch this Python C++ API so that I don't waste my breath. So how to co combine LibTorch with with, with OpenFOAM? You basically use from blob. So all fields in OpenFOAM. So the geometric field you know composes of the internal fields, and you have the the boundary fields uh, that decompose into into uh, boundary patch fields. They are all um, ulists, so they are all going to be um, uh, under the hood kind of C arrays, yeah? And we are happy for that because then uh, this makes it really easy to interact uh, with, with other software. And this is also the case for LibTorch because uh, you can kind of create a view, a point of view on 
uh, let's say the internal field in uh, like a wall scalar field um, as a tensor. So right now, like you see, I didn't copy any data. I just, um, a LibTorch just starts looking at this as, a, as, a, as its own, so to say, data set, which is, uh, or data type, which is a tensor. Uh, the rest is basically, uh, you know, you have some standard parts of the training loop. This is classical deep learning. Uh, I don't have much time, so I just took out the most important stuff from the example. Um, and then this is where you calculate these gradients. And if you do it, then you see, okay, wow, well, okay, I, I need to take the gradient, right, of my prediction of the network with respect to cell centers, because I'm trying to learn a cell-centered field, a uh, finite volume cell-centered field. And I have to prescribe one, yeah, which one? Uh, this one. So this is... Uh, this is the thing that we have to that we had before. We had to multiply by one because we have a scalar um, a neural network, and taking the Jacobian of a scalar neural network, if you remember, is exactly what we need to get the gradient x, y, and z. So coming back, okay, yeah. So and why many ones? So so why not just one scalar value? Well, because of course, uh, uh, LibTorch calculates these gradients uh, in a vectorized uh, way. So of course, it's not going to go loop from one number to the next one. And, and fetch the data and instructions that the CPU is going to do it for the whole tensor in the quickest possible way. Um, so that's why you have to specify, you see this vector V, uh, which just has ones, right? And it's the length of the, um, of, of, of NP, which is the number, number of points that we, that we used in our uh, uh, training. Okay, then again, classical uh, data uh, a loss. You can you calculate it by just taking the prediction, the difference square uh, difference difference between the prediction um, uh, and the and the training uh, data set, and then you go into the calculation of the gradient loss. Again, there's some knowledge that you have to be aware of in terms of the dimensions. Again, of of your output, the Jacobian output. Uh, you have to be aware of um, uh, how to reorder or, or transpose uh, the gradient so that this, this, this MSA loss actually will be calculated. So LibTorch gives you some informative errors on how to do that. Um, and then can, you, you can use this for guidance when you're building your own, own operators. Uh, right now, this is just the gradient. And then you sum these two errors. You just sum them up, and uh, the residual error, as you as we saw before, is just this. Just the you take the you know the magnitude of the gradient minus one, square it, sum it up over the the, the points that we that we use for training. That's our residual. So we want to solve this 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 equation. Um, uh, this is something I don't know how much time I have. Uh, five more minutes, so I'm just going to skip this. It's about how to make sure that we do this using grid search in open form. You can read this. Uh, so I'm going to skip this, but this is important. So uh, let's say you did a grid search um, and you in your grid search um, uh, told you uh, what are the best parameters that you that you did use in your grid search. And then if you look uh, into the actual um, uh, loss uh, development over these epochs, um, and again, these are example runs uh, that I ran on my laptops. You will see a laptop, you will see what, how this looks like in real time, uh, in the real application in the next slide. Uh, you see what I was talking about. So uh, the um, let's see. So the data uh, error, uh, which is the orange one, uh, is much more sensitive. Yeah, to the uh, training rate, you see the oscillations. Uh, but in an absolute sense, it has smaller values. Okay, and then uh, the gradient is the blue one, and it's covered by the green by the total training, uh, because it, it's larger, right? So the the, the learning the gradient is more problematic, so to say, than learning the data for the network. Um, and that's what I mean in terms of, you know, weighting these things. And in the exercise, you can download the source code, compile this thing, and then add some scalar coefficients and try to play with it and just get the uh, get, uh, gradient um, and the data error or to overlap as, better, as much as possible, or at least not to be different in orders of magnitude. So that's a problem. And if you, if you look at the actual run, right, where I try to reduce the error a bit more, um, it takes a long time yeah, so if you look at uh, just, this is a test case with 16 cells, uh, 16 cells per dim dimension, spatial dimension. So just 4,096 cells. I, I think we have a data set of around 400 uh, 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 cells in this case, because I sampled 10% uh, of, of all the cells in the mesh. Uh, it takes a long time to get this, uh, to get this output. And of course I trained it on the laptop. I didn't train it on the GPU or whatever, but it's also something to, to keep in mind. And this long time is coming from didn't profile the code yet, but I suspect it's um, the backward propagation that I need to evaluate the, the gradient, uh, the tangents hyperbolic. I'm not using anything smart here to um, mitigate uh, the stall of training here at the beginning, like these ad adaptive activation functions. But for a minimal example of how to do this, I think it's, it's okay. 
let me see the time. Yeah, we are fine. So um, that's it. That's what you get. So um, that's the, the, the final result. So the wireframe um, is actually what we get from the neural network. The gray surface is the exact surface. So we can congratulate ourselves. We approximated the sphere. A super simple example, but still, I think it's a, it's a nice minimal example. And you see that uh, the difference between those black and gray arrow, arrows are very small. So that's the difference between the exact gradient of the sign distance field and the narrow network gradient. And the warp surface is there just to show you where the gradient error is largest. Of course, that's going to be in the center of the sphere because if you know what how the sign distance looks like, it's going to it's not differential at the center of the sphere. Okay, so you can get the source code and data um, here. I, I've cited all this stuff, and uh, just to, to to conclude from myself, uh, from my perspective. Again, it's a super promising tool for some challenging problems. Uh, for pro prototyping stuff, it's quite nice and inverse problems, uh, optimization, parameterized PDEs, stochastic PDEs. Uh, but I, I'm, I personally don't see this replacing uh, standard numerics anytime soon for standard problems. Um, it's, it's really simple and elegant. That's why I really like it. Um, and of course, you have to learn these Jacobians and, and uh, how AD uh, calculates scalar products of Jacobians to build these operators. Um, so, um, yeah, there's some difficulty in training and what, what I find kind of missing with respect to classical numerics, uh, as I said, I'm working with multi-phase flows there, you have to look at everything. Um, so, um, um, yeah, I mean, if you, something goes wrong, you have to guess again. So that's at least my experience as, as, a, as a user of this. Uh, so numerical methods can, can use more analysis. They have more analysis available than, 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 this, than this kind of framework. And uh, it makes sense to automate um, uh, your hyperparameter tuning. Even if it's a simple grid search, uh, it makes sense to do that. So I think I'm in time. Yeah, actually one minute before my clock. So um, thank you very much and talked a lot. If there are any questions, uh, yeah, let's discuss. Uh, a quick question. Um, yeah. What is your comments on the dimensionality of the, uh, of the hidden layers? What would uh, oh, yeah. the rank look like? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I, I wanted to do profiling. There's a great tool to do this called uh, HPC Toolkit uh, that doesn't require you to uh, instrument your code. Uh, so you, you basically compile the code with some flags and it does uh, sample based profiling. Everything, memory, which you said, I didn't do it yet. Um, but yeah, that's a very good point because I think, I mean, as, as you go and try evaluate things like this, um, you no, know, then yeah. Uh, and if you have, you know, if you have, this is just like 3D example with 4,000 cells. So if I want to approximate something that's huge, I'm going to have maybe a deeper network with more layers. Uh, and I'm going to have to then store all these intermediate variables. Uh, I mean, it scales in terms of complexity. Yeah? So compared to finite differences, the evaluation of these gradients uh, scales in terms of complexity way better. But this doesn't mean that the memory fo footprint is going to be small. <laughs> I would, I would suspect the memory footprint is going to be quite large, but that's just my suspicion. I haven't done any profiling yet. Okay. Uh, another, just another question. I, I'm following from uh, Andre's uh, DMD analysis. Mm -hmm. um, does it connect well with DMD? I can imagine that it's a, a linear combination of uh, um, you know, different modes, but uh, do you get something similar in your deep learning? Okay, I, I hope that Andre is now here <laughs> because <laughs> I, I don't know a lot about. I I would I know practically nothing about uh, DMD. So so I'm I'm the wrong person to ask. Oh, you you okay. maybe better ask Andre. He he's the he's the expert. So oh, okay. okay, you caught you caught me. I, I so <laughs> it's one great one one grade less for me in the, in the exam. So I I don't know a lot about the method. I I wouldn't dare to say anything. All right. Thanks for the answers. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello. Can you hear me, Tomislav? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, ah, maybe. maybe I just quickly jump in here. Um, so I have to say uh, these two methods are really, really unrelated. So um, dynamic mode decomposition is uh, like basically linear algebra. So it's very interpretable, but also limited in terms of accuracy. And um, like these pins, they are highly non-dimensional but also um, the interpretability of these networks is really hard. So you have to, you know, there's a different research field of about how to interpret neural networks and what the layers encode. This answers your question. Ah, uh, yes, yes. It, that, then it means it's hidden, right? 
it's hidden layers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one could. Yeah, it's a it's a nice pun. Yeah, it's it's hidden layers, not because they are. Yeah, because they are hiding how they work. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have like any more questions? Hi, Thomas Love. This is Timofey. Uh, Hi. I. Uh, it's maybe thoughts out loud more than a question, but I'm, I'm thinking if we have uh, different, let's say, spatial scales in the flow, right? Mm -hmm. So then the spatial resolution would then come in through the XYZ vector that they become larger, right? So that's what I would have to do. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so the, so the, that's like, so one way, okay, yeah. So one way you can have, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. So you, you can do this. You can take more uh, XYZ um, points with the same network, but then you're going to be still limited by the um, network architecture because the, the number of layers and uh, the length of each layer uh, determines uh, the uh, functions that this network can approximate. So, so if you have a deeper, larger network, um, then uh, you have a more broad coverage um, of the functions that you can approximate. It has other caveats, other problems, but in general, I mean, you, you couldn't, so to say, try to approximate some highly nonlinear function by a very short um, in, uh, you know, network. That's, that's, so these are two things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess if it has to be aware of uh, different spatial scales, then I, I have to give it to more, le uh, more let's say, dense XYZ vector. Yeah. But then I guess the size of the layer also has to grow because if I have a very small layer to which I input this big X, Y, Z, then it's some kind of agglomeration of them, right? Because you yeah. you apply a linear transformation that'll be from some small, well, to, if, you, if you do it from a very large input to a small layer, then, well, it's some kind of, not exactly averaging, but some kind of loss of information in some sense. Yeah, I so think that, I mean, to me, uh, what, 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 to me, it seems that if I want to do, for example, a turbulent flow of this, then I would need a really huge network. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so. Uh, I agree. Uh, and also, I mean, in terms of how these layers, so there, there, there are some, I think, um, again, I'm, I'm just like starting with, with, with uh, deep learning. So this is the only topic that I know something about. Um, but if I remember uh, reading from, from the literature about these convolutional neural networks, so I think the, the, the if I remember correctly, uh, Andre is here, I'm, I'm happy, uh, uh, he, he can correct me. So these networks, so they, they, they kind of do um, a kind, of a, kind of like a spectral analysis of the input, not really, but kind of. So they catch uh, first uh, the, 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 the largest, uh, so to say, um, wavelengths. Uh, so the largest features, right? And then um, uh, they catch the smaller ones F, uh, later on in the training. And also these layers, they, you, you have some kind of, you know, super hand wavy um, uh, descriptions uh, where people uh, try to visualize what actually each layer does. Uh, I think it was in, in uh, uh, image recognition where you can actually then like output, uh, take the output from each layer and then see how it looks like. Uh, for input data and then you see that some like the first layers they approximate something rough and then as you go deeper into the network you get like finer approximations but this is like you know compared to writing down uh, uh, you know your numerical scheme and then uh, analyzing it with math it's it's a different world yeah. it's a completely different world yeah yeah thanks for the talk yeah okay Uh, one question that I have is related to comparison between numerical simulation and uh, this physics form method. Uh, for numerical simulation, we know that uh, there are two aspects that we want to improve the performance. One is uh, computational time, we want to decrease that. Another is accuracy. Which aspect do you think this method, this physics informed deep learning, can provide a better results maybe in the future? Um, 
Okay, so again, I'm just uh, I'm a beginner, so take this with a grain of salt. What I'm what I'm saying, but um, my answer would be none uh, um, from what you listed. Right? So you asked about computational expense and you asked about accuracy. Let me just go to so okay, you will see what I mean. So the, there are these, okay, yeah. So this is the stuff that's, that's maybe I was too fast because I was limited by time. So these are the problems where this thing is super strong. So um, if, you, if, you have, if you have problems, if you compare, you, you said sort of, if I compare a neural network with a classical and we want to reduce uh, computational efforts, we want to increase accuracy. Uh, if you take, if you have a standard problem, I wouldn't even do that. I don't know, maybe, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I just, as I said, I just started, so I'm not maybe the right, the right person to answer this, but my impression is there are so many variables here, like in terms of hyperparameters, in terms of uh, solver parameters, in terms of uh, this thing converging, um, uh, the, the way it trains, how to incre uh, increase e efficacy here. Then if you have a huge, like what Timofey asked, like if you have turbulence, then you have to either have a, I don't even, have, I mean, you have to have somehow figure out, figure out how to train this, these net, large networks across multiple GPUs actually to, to I don't know, it's like super, super challenging for standard problems. I don't know how this will work. Maybe it will, but I'm, I'm kind of super, super suspicious. But if you, if you kind of have things where you, you're not sure about um, your boundary condition uh, or you want to do modeling, so you can actually, um, you can write down um, uh, the PDE, you can write down the PDE loss and you can say, um, I have a boundary condition um, X. Yeah, you, you write down the boundary condition um, and then you can add multiple boundary conditions uh, for the same uh, boundary patch and multiply them, uh, those boundary conditions by a, a scalar multiplier. Uh, that's going to be a part of the optimization. And then the network is going to tell you which boundary condition fits best, so to say, to your problem. So things like this, which is why I'm doing this with, with classical CFD would uh, um, include like huge amount of computations and and this is something where this is sen sensible. So I wouldn't compare this to, to, to like directly compare it to classical numerics. So I can tell you from my side, so if, if, if I'm, I want to do this, I can try to take a neural network as an initial guess for a deterministic algorithm. So if my guess, the initial uh, guess for a deterministic algorithm is very bad, um, then I can take a neural network um, uh, to start, uh, start better. Uh, uh, in, in, in a sense, right? To, if you want to approximate, let's say, the normal of the fluid interface, uh, that's one of the topics in geometric volume of fluid method. So you can take a pin, get it to, to, to uh, uh, give you a better value than the previous time step value or the gradient of the volume fraction. Yeah. Talk a lot. I don't know if, it, if this <laughs> helps you or not. Hope it does. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I've been working on physics for, for one year. And uh, at the end, my conclusion was that uh, for CFD, we reach at a system of equation and the, all of the expense is to solve this system of equations, the most, most expensive part. And for neural network, we reach to optimization problem. Mm -hmm. And if we can uh, solve this optimization problem faster, I mean, if we work on that, because for linear solvers, we have worked on them a lot of time for, for decades, but for solution of optimization problems, we worked less. So do you think uh, this, I mean, if we work on optimization methods that can solve problem faster, uh, that yeah. can, I mean, reduce the computational time for these problems? Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the, one of the um, I don't remember, I think it was like at the end of the deep learning. So this, um, so if you, I mean, this is something that I'm, I'm personally going to look into next. So this Bayesian optimization is one of the, uh, one of the kind of seems to be quite a powerful tool to do exactly what you're asking. So to, to have a, you know, a computational framework that can sample the hyperparameter space in a much clever way uh, than uh, myself or a PhD student. So in this case, if you have some kind of an automatic framework, you can you know, let it, so to say, work for you in, in a sense. It's not completely unsupervised. You have to model some, some, um, some things, um, but, but I think that's, that's something that could be promising, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? That's pretty much it from our side. Okay, cool, yeah. So I hope it was um, useful. <laughs> Again, just 
Um, I, yeah, do you have time or? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, you take your uh, initial vector, which is u, right? Um, yeah. uh, X, y, z, and t. Uh, I, I have difficulty understanding how does it translate to uh, velocity information? Because that would be a completely different information, right? Uh, yeah, so basically um, you just, instead of having just one output here, uh, you would have um, a u, or not u, maybe, maybe like, V1, V2, V3. So you would have three components uh, of your uh, velocity. So you, you would map X, Y, uh, Z, uh, and T, and you would, instead of psi, which is a scalar value for the passive scalar transport equation, you would, let's say, have the momentum equation, uh, uh, momentum conservation equation in CFD. So you would like to have a mapping to three components of the velocity. And everything stays the same. Because, I mean, the difference here, so, um, um, the, 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 this, the square changes because then you're not squaring um, a vector. You maybe have to um, uh, take the norm, yeah, you, because you will have to have you will have a difference, you know, of the velocity uh, being produced by the neural network. So this psi um, is going to be the first psi is going to be a vector minus the vector that you have of the velocity at x, at x y, z, at t. And then you have to take the Euclidean norm of this vector to 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 and sum this up, yeah, just mathematically. Uh, and everything else stays the same. I mean, you, you're basically your gradients here. Let's go to the, so you'll see where we did the calculation. So um, in this case, the Jacobian uh, is again calculated. The only difference is the Jacobian of the velocity field is not going to be um, a gradient um, like this. It's going to be, um, okay, if you have T, I'm not sure now, um, but it's going to be a, a large matrix. So it's not going to be like a column vector. It's going to be a larger matrix because we are taking a Jacobian of a vector. In this case, you don't multiply with one if you want to approximate the gradient of the, of the velocity. You know what I mean? So you have to then figure out what you need because you're going to have T there. Yeah. So, and then you have to figure out which vector and you like, like here, right? So you will have something like that looks like this. Uh, instead of psi, you're going to have uh, velocity X, velocity Y, velocity Z. And then you have to figure out what you get when you take the Jacobian or the Hessian from this, and how do you multiply this monster with which matrices and vectors to, to get the operator that you want. Right? So your operators for the velocity are going to be, again, the same. So you're going to be the gradient of the velocity in the um, uh, Laplacian uh, term in the momentum conservation equation. You have the divergence um, uh, of the velocity uh, in the um, Convective term in the momentum equation, so you need divergence as well, and so on. So that the pro it all stays the same. It's just like you sitting down with a piece of paper, writing this down, and figuring out uh, what you have to calculate um, in the changes. Yeah, uh, it sounds very really, uh, non-physical. <laughs> A lot of transformations, but yeah, thanks for your answer. I mean, non-physical in the, in, in the sense, yeah, you, you non, if you mean non-physical in the sense of you get some combinations of partial derivatives that you don't need for your momentum conservation, yeah, but then you just, you don't use them. You just gather up stuff that you actually need to use. So, okay. Because I mean, the, 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 when people that wrote these frameworks, they don't know what you need in terms of operators. So, so if you think about CFD is not the only thing out there, so you can do quantum, quantum mechanics or something, and then you're going to have crazy PDEs and they have crazy partial derivatives, crazy with respect from our perspective, maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, so then maybe you need some kind of weird, like, you know, term, yeah. Okay. okay. Thomas, so thank you very much. Uh, there was a large applause, but I wasn't pressing the button. Uh, so thank you for your talk and that's pretty much it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you.